tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. A woman is listed among the hundreds of missing following the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. She would be assumed dead if it weren't for one troubling fact. She disappeared the night before the Twin Towers collapsed. Best friends since childhood, Diane Shawcroft and Jennifer Luth moved to a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona and immersed themselves in the local single scene. Two months later, both would be dead. Authorities now need your help in finding their killer. A divorced mother disappears under bizarre circumstances. Suspicion focuses on her estranged husband, who is described by some as a loving father, but by others as a sadistic psychopath. And now he is a fugitive from justice. A young, beautiful girl becomes lost in the neon glitter of Reno. She leaves behind paranoid emails, gruesome drawings, and books on how to change her identity. Her family prays that someone in our audience can help Star Palumbo find her way home. Join me for these fascinating stories. Perhaps someone somewhere has that one vital clue that can solve a mystery. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Everywhere you looked, they stared back. Painful reminders of the human toll taken by the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Following September 11th, New York City was blanketed with homemade posters of missing loved ones. Joining the thousands of distraught family and friends canvassing the city was Ron Lieberman. His wife, a 31-year-old physician of Indian descent named Sneha Philip, was last seen in the vicinity of the World Trade Center. But Sneha's story is drastically different from the other hundreds of people still listed as missing and presumed dead. In fact, Sneha Philip disappeared on September 10th, 14 hours before the Twin Towers' catastrophic collapse. While she may have been caught in the World Trade Center disaster, Sneha may have also succumbed to foul play. Her fate remains a mystery. I think this is a very difficult situation because of the confusion with September 11th that leaves every single possibility open. I mean, in our heads right now, anything is possible. I pronounce them, they are husband and wife in the name of God. Only one year earlier, Ron and Snea were exchanging vows of everlasting love. Their future happiness seemed assured. There are certain people that you meet in your life who just, you connect with so strongly, and right away we knew, and uh, basically inseparable since the first day we, we met. The newlyweds shared an apartment in Battery Park City, an exclusive neighborhood just four blocks from the World Trade Center. At 11.15 a.m. on September 10th, Ron left for his shift as a doctor at Jacoby Hospital. Snea, who was also a doctor, had the next three days off. Hey, hang on one second. I kissed her, I told her I loved her, and I left. Ron was leaving for work. Luckily, I left my keys at home, so I went back. Keys. And I got to kiss her again, and that was the last time that I saw her. When Ron returned at 11.15 that night, Snea was not home, but Ron felt there was no reason to be concerned. 
my schedule is so crazy, so sometimes she would feel uncomfortable staying by herself at home. And her brother lives very close by, and her cousin also lives very close by. So she would sometimes go spend the night with them. And I thought, well, maybe she just decided to stop at her brother's house or uh, her cousin. The following morning, Ron rose early and headed to work for an 8 a.m. meeting. He expected Sneha to call him once she woke up. September 11th began as a perfect day. The weather was unseasonably warm and the sky a brilliant blue. Like Ron, millions of New Yorkers went about their daily routines, unaware that the entire world teetered on the verge of disaster. What happened? There was an accident. A plane hit the World Trade Center. After the meeting, I came outside and we saw the TVs were on and uh, we saw the first plane hit. So I immediately went and called home. Sneha, if you're there, pick up the phone. And there was just the, the message machine on. I need you to call me and let me know that you're okay. I love you. And then we learned that the, a second plane hit and now everyone realized that this is an attack. And then when the buildings came down, Everyone was just, you know, people were crying, but still trying to work. And it was a very, very emotional time, I think, for, obviously, for everyone. I called back again about 10 o'clock in the morning. Still, just the message machine was on. And then after that, the phones went dead. I was frightened for my wife because I couldn't get in touch with her. I was sad with what happened, devastated by the whole situation. You know, there's so many emotions. Everyone is in shock. And where's my wife? I, I don't know. Ron Lieberman's personal nightmare coincided with one of the worst global nightmares in history. Imagine trying to find your wife in the chaos and confusion following the tragedy of the World Trade Center. Any evidence as to what happened to Snea Phillip was most likely buried under 1.2 million tons of rubble. Still, Ron Lieberman prayed that Snea was simply lost in the turmoil enveloping New York City and that she would soon find her way home. Ron's hopes were based on Snea spending the previous night with her brother or cousin. But when he finally got through to them, both said they had not seen or heard from Snea in over 48 hours. Realizing that no one had spoken to her yet, I realized that this is a serious situation. At that point, I decided, you know, I'm going to try to get down to the apartment. All roads into Lower Manhattan were closed. Only emergency vehicles were being permitted through the barricades. Ron hitched a ride in an ambulance, and then made his way on foot to the apartment. The scene down there was just chaos. It was this, one of the most scariest sights I've ever seen in my life. As I started approaching my apartment building, I started seeing trucks blown up, fire engines turned upside down, pieces of the building, or what looked like the building on the ground also. Ron's apartment in Battery Park City was chained shut. Snay! He soon learned from a neighbor that Snea was not in the building. So now at this point, I, I didn't know what to do. I knew, with all the chaos going on, I thought, well, how am I going to find her right now? And I went back to my friend's place, and I spent the night. And that was a very difficult night. I was by myself on the couch wondering where my wife was, frightened that something awful happened. The day following the attacks, Ron filed a missing persons report with the NYPD. We knew she was missing since Monday. Um, and when we told the detective, they just said, OK, we'll take your missing persons report. But that was lumped into the World Trade Center. You got the feeling that the police were just completely overwhelmed and that they had very little time or effort to be able to put forth towards this. The NYPD believes that Snea was more than likely one of the many lost in the World Trade Center disaster. But Ron was convinced that she disappeared the night before. He hired a private eye and launched an investigation of his own. They would uncover several disturbing questions, but one above all others had haunted Ron from the start. Where was Snea on the night of September 10th? Ron discovered that an employee at the couple's apartment building remembered seeing Snea that evening. 
Okay, Tom. Um, I've At 5.15 p.m., he saw her leaving alone, wearing a brown dress and sandals. By tracing credit card receipts, Brown found evidence that Sneha may have then gone shopping at a department store near the World Trade Center. At 7.15 p.m., shoes, lingerie, and bed linens were purchased with Sneha's credit card. But was it Sneha who used the card, or an imposter who had stolen it? Excuse me. From what was purchased, it sounded like it was her. You know, sheets for the beds and things like that, so we assumed it was her. Uh, without proof yet. Ron hoped to find that proof on the department store's surveillance video. And for about two weeks, I sat and watched this tape for about five hours a day, you know, frame by frame. It's one of those stop action photos where I actually found my wife on the tape, shopping alone. After the department store, Snea's trail turns completely cold. She leaves the store and then she just disappears. There is not a trace of her, nothing, not a credit card transaction, no money taken out of her account, no emails, no phone calls, nothing. How does that happen? It's, it's a complete mystery. Where did Snea go after leaving the department store? She was carrying two large bags of merchandise, but neither the bags nor the merchandise were found at Snea's apartment, suggesting that she never made it back home. Near the department store stood the Millennium Hotel. Inside was a connoisseur bar and grill. The private investigator hired by Ron theorized that Snea could have stopped in for a drink. Is it possible that something happened here that ultimately led to her disappearance? The Millennium Hotel was closed down after the attack, frustrating Ron and the investigator's efforts to see if she went there. In fact, the entire area where Snea was last seen lay in ruins. As a result, any theory about what happened to her was virtually impossible to prove. Was Snea a victim of random violence? Could she have left on her own accord to start a new life? The question seemed endless. Any answers were surely destroyed along with the Twin Towers. But then a mysterious clue emerged spinning the investigation into an entirely unexpected direction. A clerk at the department store saw the missing flyer of Snea and stepped forward, giving Ron and Snea's family renewed hope. From the shoe sales clerk, told us that she remembers my wife and that she'd known her as somewhat of a regular customer. Good shoes, then. Is that your sister? Oh, no, she's just a friend of mine and that she remembered her there that day and said that she was with another person, an Indian woman, and that she just said was her friend. You too. Okay, bye. bye. Have a good day. You too. And then they said that after she went to buy shoes that they were thinking about going to the lingerie area. Based on this new information, Ron re-examined the department store surveillance tape. Two women are captured leaving the store together. Could this be Snea and her companion? So far, all efforts to identify the mysterious woman have failed. We have no idea who this person is and that she never existed in Snaz's past. We've gone through her phone books, we've gone through her email. There is no, like, phone call even made to this person during that day. She doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, I, it could be very possible that Snaz ran into her. It could be an old-time friend. Is it possible that Snea stayed at the unidentified woman's house on the night of September 10th? If that was the case, then Snea could well have been heading home the next morning at the approximate time of the World Trade Center attack. If Snea was near the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th, knowing the kind of person she was, it would just be instinctual with her to try to help and she would, might have gone into the building or she might have helped people out. It would have just been, that's the kind of person she is. She just cares about people. If Snea was inside the World Trade Center, she had no chance of surviving. But that scenario assumes that Snea was alive the previous night and spent it somewhere other than with Ron, her family, and all of her known friends. 
she's never just spent a night out without informing us where she is, informing her husband where she is. It's never happened. Why would this night be any different? So, I mean, I really think that something happened to her September 10th. It's difficult to, to continue, you know, each day is a day that, you, that we suffer because we don't know. You know, sometimes I think she might just walk through the door or she might just call. But it just, each day doesn't happen and uh, it's, it's, it's really torture. The Cedar Creek Apartments outside of Phoenix, Arizona, a brutal heat wave passes through the region. Love this After graduating from high school, Diane Shawcroft, 20, and her best friend Jennifer Luth, 19, had left their homes in Colorado for the sunny suburb of Glendale, Arizona. Don't tell me to relax. They moved in with Diane's older sister, Christina. But three young women living in a one-bedroom apartment soon led to tension. When did you become mom? I said no smoking. That was my last cigarette. It's fine. Maybe I'll just go then. Maybe you should. They said they were going to walk to the store to get cigarettes and a, and a pop, and that they would be back in a little while. They didn't take anything with them, and they never went anywhere without their makeup. So that's what made me think they were coming right back. I'll talk it out with her. We'll no, it out. we're not going Diane and Jennifer headed for the mini mart two blocks away. They never returned. For the first time in their lives, Diane Shawcroft and Jennifer Luth were living away from home. The girls began to explore the boundaries of their newfound freedom. They were swept into an exhilarating whirlwind of late nights, new friendships, and lively parties. But authorities now fear that Diane and Jennifer's carefree lifestyle may have ultimately put them in harm's way. Diane and Jenny were very, very close. They were probably closer than most sisters. Uh, Jenny was a little more flirtatious. Diane was a little quieter and more shy, but she's the one that basically took care of both of them, I believe. We're so happy. Hi. Hi. You guys having fun? So they were pretty open to just about anybody. They liked to hang out. They liked to have lots of friends. But they liked to go, go, go. They wanted to be doing something all the time. They didn't care if it was 3 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon. On the day they disappeared, Diane and Jennifer were seen at a mini-mart at approximately 7 p.m. Hey, girls. Hey. How are we doing? Good. According to the cashier, the girls bought cigarettes and soda. But instead of going home, they lingered outside the store. Two hours passed. The girls were still in front of the mini-mart when the cashier saw a man pull up in a blue truck. They conversed for quite a while. They got into the truck, and then the truck drove off. And that's the last time that uh, anyone that we know of has seen them alive. I believe she knew this person because she would never, ever get into a vehicle with strangers. She just wouldn't do it. She wasn't the kind that would hitchhike or do anything like that. She was very careful and very cautious. Three months later, two men were hunting in a remote desert 100 miles north of Phoenix. As they traversed a steep incline, they came across a gruesome sight. Diane Lynn Shawcroft lay on top of Jennifer Sue Luth. Both had been murdered. Even in death, Diane seemed to be protecting her best friend. Because the investigation is ongoing, police are withholding the cause of death. But the location of the girls' bodies offered several clues as to who the killer or killers might be. The 
The area is extremely isolated, 16 miles from the nearest highway and accessible only by pickup truck or four-wheel drive. We feel that this person has probably been in this area or frequent in this area or certainly was aware of this area in some way by their own uh, four-wheel driving or hunting or at least uh, some personal knowledge of the area. The deepness of the ravine also raised another troubling possibility. They were both fairly decent sized girls, so you would have had to have handled each one of those. So either we had a very strong person or we had more than one person possibly that were involved in taking these bodies out. Jennifer was a strong girl and she was a scrapper if she needed to be. It wouldn't be easy for one person to overpower Jennifer alone, but with two of them, it's, it's just sort of inconceivable to me that one person was able to do that to two girls. The police investigation centered on finding the mysterious man in the blue truck. Believing that both girls knew this man, police delved into their personal lives. While in Phoenix, Diane and Jennifer had attended numerous parties and nightclubs. They had a lifestyle with a lot of males involved in it. Uh, there were a lot of male friends, male relationships. They were involved in so many people's lives. They were involved in many strangers' lives uh, to the point it could have been somebody they just met. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Colorado. From this really small town where it's like zero degrees right now. We're so happy to be here. <laughs> I think both Ginny and Diana were very naive and very innocent. I think like most 19-year-olds, they think they're invincible and can just conquer the world. It reminds me, my friends having a uh, little pool party tonight. There's going to be kegs, lots of people. You guys should come down. Really? Yeah. And I think whoever got involved with them knew that, could read them like a book, and took advantage of them. There is one final strange twist to this case. The families erected a shrine where the bodies were found. Pictures of both girls were placed at the foot of two wood crosses. Police decided to occasionally survey the site, hoping for a morbid visit from the killer. No one ever showed up, at least while authorities were at the scene. On September 29, 2000, Detectives discover that both photos of the girls had been removed from their frames. Only police and the victim's family knew the precise location where the girls' bodies had been found. Nothing else seemed to be disturbed, and it definitely raised questions as to who would want the pictures, who would go to that much effort uh, to go back in as far as it is, uh, get the pictures and, and, and take them. Um, Hard to even imagine who it'd be or, or why they would do it unless it's the perpetrator. Had the killer returned for a macabre souvenir of his brutal act? Police can only speculate. No evidence that might identify the murder has ever been found. The search for Diane and Jennifer's killer or killers continues. Authorities would especially like to question the man who was the last person seen with the girls. He may be driving a blue pickup truck. Hello? Two friends of 44-year-old Brenda Bowen arrive at her rural Alabama home after she fails to show up for a prayer meeting earlier that morning. Brenda! But Brenda is nowhere to be found. Hello, anybody home? No, what Within hours, the Shelby County Sheriff's Office responds to the scene. Brenda's clothes were laid out on her bed as if to dress after she got through with her, her shower. On her dresser was her jewelry. Everything was laid out real nice and neat. Also, they saw her curling iron was uh, in the own position in, in the bathroom. 
but there was no other signs that, you know, Brenda was there at all. Brenda Bowen lived a life most of us would envy. She was blessed with two healthy teenage children, a thriving real estate business, and a sprawling home in the beautiful Alabama countryside. Her friends and family could find no reason why she would suddenly vanish. When Brenda went missing, it was devastating to us. I stayed at home. I thought she might call, you know. But in my heart, I knew that something had happened to Brenda, something bad. The only source of friction in Brenda's life was her ex-husband, Jerry Lee Bowen. Two years earlier, Brenda's long-lasting marriage to Jerry had abruptly fallen apart. They were together for about 18 or 19 years, and they'd worked good together. But Jerry, Jerry got out and found a girlfriend. And he asked her for a divorce. Jerry, you've agreed to give Brenda complete and unencumbered use of the house until your daughter turns 19. Uh, Brenda, you will give Jerry use of the guest house in the back as his office. With the help of a divorce attorney, Jerry and Brenda separated on good terms and even agreed to a very unusual living arrangement. Jerry would reside in the guest house behind the main residence. He also gave Brenda the bulk of the couple's assets. Jerry lived quietly in the shadow of his ex-wife until he ran into financial difficulties. Brenda, I'm asking for your help here. I don't know, Jerry. You're asking me to live a lie. It's only a business arrangement. Not and he told her he was in financial trouble and they had to get back together. He had to have some relief. Brenda's answer was, I'd have to think about that, Jerry. So you're not going to help me? I, I don't know, Jerry. Can't we talk about this in the morning? Jerry? Jerry, we can talk about it in the morning. I'm going to take you back to court. Four days later, Brenda Bowen vanished. Anything you'll find, I want bag, I want it filed. Police began their investigation at the Bowen home. Jerry Bowen was fully cooperative and even offered his own theory on what happened to Brenda. As I started to leave, Jerry says, well, Don, what do you think happened to Brenda? Well, let's just hope she's on a beach somewhere down in Florida, tan in her buns. You're wrong. She's dead. I said, well, if she's dead, where do you think we could find her? And Jerry looked at me and he says, you could find her in water somewhere. You got a call about an abandoned vehicle? That same night, Brenda's car was found stuck in the mud 43 miles from her home. We found uh, personal items belonging to Brenda there. We, we found her purse. We, uh, we found the cell phone. There was checkbooks there. So that told us that this was not a robbery, that uh, perhaps the car was left where it was just as a decoy, that Brenda would not be found there. This here's the boy. Brenda's own son raised an even more troubling question about the car. I was wondering what the position of the driver's seat was in. All the way back, right? Yeah, it was all the way back. Well, um, my mom, she's only 5'2". With the car seat completely pushed back, Brenda's feet could not have reached the pedals. But the strangest question of all came out of Jerry Bowen's own mouth when he unexpectedly appeared at the crime scene. Is that the car that belongs to the woman who's missing? Yes. Now, this was his ex-wife's car. He knew whose car that was. And it turned out later to be a question that we felt was very important to pinning down as to who was responsible for Brenda's death. Jerry was taken to the Shelby County Sheriff's Office for an interview, where his behavior continued to raise red flags. He was not of any help to us whatsoever. He, he showed uh, no concern for her well-being. And uh, during the process of the interview, he actually went to sleep. But Jerry's friends and family adamantly claimed that he was in a state of shock and overcome with worry for his former wife. 
Jerry was very concerned about her, but he was also upset that the police thought it might be him. He said often that, that he was innocent, so there was no way he was going to be pinned with a murder. They stripped him down. They checked him for any cuts or bruises or bites or anything. They didn't find a scratch on him anywhere. But they got in his face and told him, we know you did something to her, whatever happened to her. We know you did it, and we will prove it. And they had tunnel vision from that night on. Amount of zero doubt in my mind that Jerry Bowen killed my daughter Brenda. No doubt. But there was no evidence linking Jerry Bowen to his wife's disappearance, and he was released. Several months later, three fishermen saw something floating in the murky waters of the Kusaw River. It was the body of Brenda Bowen, bound and tied inside a sheet. The advanced state of decomposition made it impossible for the coroner to determine the cause of death. When Brenda Bowen's body surfaced, she was, for lack of a better way of saying it, packaged in a certain manner. We got the call late this afternoon. Three fishermen found the body. Around her body was a green top sheet off of a bed. Around that was a length of nylon rope. You want to secure the area all the way up to the road before the forensic boys get here. The sheet was positively identified as coming from the Bowen home. And there were several curious aspects about the rope. It was tied with two specific knots, a boland and a slip, and the ends had been deliberately burnt. The son asked to look at the rope that was around his mother's body. And he looked at it, and tears filled his eyes. He said, I've seen that same combination of knots from Jerry Bowen dozens of times. He said, I've never seen anybody else do it. In addition to that, every time Jerry Bowen cut a piece of nylon rope, he would take a cigarette lighter and burn the ends of it. The knots, the car seat, the burned ends of the rope, it all starts pointing back to Jerry Bowen. Jerry Bowen was arrested and tried for the murder of his wife, Brenda. The case against him was almost entirely circumstantial, except for one crucial element. Jerry could not account for his whereabouts prior to 9.30 in the morning of Brenda's disappearance. The jury took only six hours to decide his fate, guilty. But the bizarre story of Jerry Bowen did not end with his conviction. While awaiting sentencing, Bowen was released on bond. The day of the hearing, Jerry's sister received a blunt letter. It read, this may be a dumb move on my part, sis, but I don't feel I should serve time for a crime I didn't commit. Therefore, I am running. When Jerry was convicted, my thoughts was, it's payday. When Jerry fled, I felt like payday evaporated. And it, and it did. The FBI descended on Jerry's home looking for any clues as to his whereabouts. But no one was prepared for what was found on Jerry's computer. Thousands of violent and sadistic pornographic images. Jerry is very polite, uh, respectful to others. But when he's back in his own secret place, within his own residence, the bizarreness of his uh, behavior starts to emerge when he's visiting websites of women being abused, tied up, uh, shackled, and tortured, as well as a fascination for pregnant women that are uh, naked. No other evidence was recovered from Jerry's home that would lead detectives to the convicted killer. He has now evaded capture for over a year. He's still on the loose, and we, we can't have closure until he's found and come back to the Sheriff's Department where he belongs. I hope they bring him in chains.
In the early morning hours of April 26, 2000, a young woman is spotted wandering in a restricted area of the Reno Tahoe International Airport. She appears disoriented and frightened. An airport police officer is called. He finds a woman cowering near a truck. The woman identifies herself as Star Palumbo. She then claims she's trying to find her younger sister who is running loose on the tarmac. Okay, we searched the grounds for your sister with the description that you gave us. She's nowhere to be found. The airport police officer felt there was a possibility the Star's story was not true, but he also believed the Star had no criminal intent for being out on the runway. He had no idea why she was out there. She could give no logical explanation. But instead of arresting her, he decided to release her. Star Palumbo is dropped off near a hotel and disappears into the kaleidoscope of blinding neon lights. The next day, an illegally parked car is discovered at the airport. And while I ran a routine license check on it, upon the impound sheet, the registered owner came back to Star Palumbo. As I was going through the, the vehicle during the impound, I found it appeared to be loaded with all her personal possessions. Also in the car were Star's cell phone and purse, including $600 in cash. And Star had left behind other items that caused even more concern. Copies of three emails sent to the White House indicated that Star felt the government was trying to murder her. A morbid drawing depicted a woman who looked like Star bound and gagged. And finally, there were two books on how to change your identity. Star never showed up to claim her car. She has now been missing for over a year. There are two very likely possibilities. The first is that she is suffering from some type of either organically caused or drug-induced psychosis and is a sick woman and doesn't know who or where she is. And the second possibility, uh, sadly, is that she's been the victim of a serious crime and has either been murdered or is in a position where she can't contact her friends and family. The mystery of what happened to Star Palumbo began long before the 25-year-old woman vanished. Star was once a vivacious brunette full of hope and promise. But authorities believe that she tragically drifted into another world of drugs and desperation, placing her life in imminent danger. Her family is convinced that Star is alive and with your help will one day come home. Star lived a very happy childhood and She's very dependable, and she's a very trusting person. She's a very happy person, sociable person, and she really, I guess, trusted people too much. One year prior to her disappearance, Starr left her home in Tucson, Arizona, and moved to Reno, Nevada. She lived there with her grandmother. It was in Reno investigators believed the Starr's life began to careen off course. Interviews with Star's friends there revealed a portrait of a troubled woman who had lost her way. In this particular case, uh, Star seems to have fallen in with a very bad crowd and had been involved in a more increasing uh, degree of drug use, and specifically with methamphetamine, uh, at a level that could only be disastrous. According to her friends, in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, Star's drug habit cost more than she could make as a cashier at a pawn shop. Police believe it is possible that the increasingly distraught woman began to look for other ways to make money. There is uh, an indication that Star had been dabbling in prostitution. In her phone books, there was reference to a number of men uh, we really don't have a good feeling for the extent of the relationships with a number of those men. However, uh, certainly prostitution is a high-risk occupation, and one of the factors that causes us concern about uh, what has befallen Star in her disappearance. While in Reno, Star continued to call her mother on a weekly basis and seemed in good spirits. But on the day she disappeared, Star made a final phone call that took on an ominous and paranoid tone. She would only talk to us for a little bit. She said that she felt 
somebody was following her, and when she talked on the phone, she thought maybe the phones were tapped and somebody was listening, and she mentioned how something was going on and she was afraid for her life, and she wouldn't discuss it any more than that. According to her mother, Star expressed a desire to turn her life around. She then talked about flying home to Tucson and starting over. I love you. Okay, bye. Gail Palumbo has not heard from her daughter since. Following Star's disappearance, her parents mounted a massive effort to locate their daughter. Thousands of flyers were distributed, and Star's picture was posted throughout the state of Nevada. It appears that those efforts have paid off. Linda Fields, owner of the Silver Dollar Casino in Elko, Nevada, claims to have seen Star there a full eight months after her disappearance. Honey, honey, are you all right? Miss Fields described uh, seeing a young woman who, in her mind, uh, she was very certain was Star Palumbo, who had come into the bar uh, one evening, um, had looked frightened, um, was alone, and that the young woman had volunteer, uh, volunteered to her that her name was Star, and that she was being chased or was trying to escape from a pimp. Linda Field says that Star became extremely agitated when a man peered through the bar's window. A short time after that, Star left the bar with another young woman. If the woman was Star, then where did she go after leaving the bar? Maybe there really was somebody after her. Could she have used the books found in her car to change her identity and escape? It is this scenario the Star's family clings to. I'd like to say, Star, that your mom and dad really love you. And no matter what you've done or anything, that we wish you'd contact us, see if we could help you. Join me next time for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries.